All right. Today is Thursday, February 3rd, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. The crazy market volatility goes on. Unbelievable moves up or down. We're going to discuss all of that and a lot more. But here it is, in focus tonight. The biggest crash in the history of the stock market. We're talking about Facebook, a.k.a. Meta. And then, let's go over some earnings that we got today. And lastly, a preview of the upcoming jobs number tomorrow. And we start with this. The headline reads, Meta is poised to suffer the largest one-day wipeout in corporate history. Its valuation slumped by nearly $220 billion when Wall Street opened Thursday. Make that $270 billion. Yep, almost a quarter of a trillion dollars. Poof gone like a bag of potatoes and you might ask why why did facebook lose a quarter of a trillion dollars today hold your horses we're gonna answer that and a lot more but before we do that here's the bragging part because somebody saw this happening ahead of time guess who take a listen what about facebook i bought some calls today from a daily chart perspective the name is beaten down severely and we have extreme oversold conditions here on the momentum indicators, the RSI and the MACD. Therefore, we're waiting and anticipating a pop higher, a short covering rally. The problem is, whatever rally it is, it could be just an ABC pattern and the bearishness will resume in Facebook. Because on the weekly chart, the pain just started for this name. The momentum indicators are moving down from extreme elevated levels, meaning that the correction is not over in this name. But on the daily, we're waiting for a relief rally, a short covering rally. And then the shorts will pile on Facebook again and drive it down. Here's a monthly chart for Facebook, by the way, and it is trading on a very steep trend line. The likelihood is this line will be broken. And as you can see, the MACD indicator is topping for now. So on the weekly, on the monthly, the picture is not good for Facebook. On the daily, it's okay for a relief rally. And here it is, folks, the daily chart of Facebook. The reverse ABC pattern that I was talking about in that clip, as you can see, happened. And then here is the weekly chart. And as you can see, the chart unfolded exactly as I told you. We saw the bear flag pattern, consolidation from a weekly perspective, and then the flush down. And here's the monthly chart. We had a defined steep, keyword steep, trend line. And when you have trend lines that steep, they're not going to last for too long. They produce massive flush downs. And this is exactly what happened in Facebook stock. So once again, the fundamentals, the technicals, matter a lot in stock market trading and investing. And the charts sometimes they try to speak to you ahead of time what you have to do is take your bias throw that out of the window and listen to what the charts are trying to say so why did facebook crash today let's hear the excuses first from facebook executives we start with this how about tiktok Mark Zuckerberg says it's TikTok. TikTok is stealing our lunch. As if TikTok just launched a few months ago. TikTok has been here for years. And we already knew that Facebook is an aging platform and the Gen Zers are flocking to TikTok. This is not new at all. Despite that, the concentration on Instagram and small businesses within Facebook platform kept this company afloat despite the competition from TikTok. So there is something else here that Zucchiniberg is not talking about. Here's another one. They blame Apple, the AI mob. They say due to the privacy changes in the iPhones and the Apple Store, we lost $10 billion. And of course, don't get me wrong, the AI mob is a criminal organization. They have the racketeering operation called the App Store, where every app, any business that uses the App Store, and by the way, why do we have to use the App Store? It's because the iMob said so. That's why. But if you use the App Store, or if you conduct business on the iPhone either way, you gotta kick up 30% of your revenue to the iMob, also known as the rent. The rent. Pay for the rent. The rent. The rent. Otherwise, the iMob will find you if you don't pay the rent, and they will crack your kneecaps. They ban you from the store. And of course, your beloved politicians are not doing anything at all to stop this abuse by the iMob and the monopoly of the App Store. Why? Because Apple has 
the politicians, the judges, the cops, the pension funds, all in their pockets because they're all invested in Apple stock. It's the largest stock in the world. If you have a retirement account, you're investing in the iMob either way, whether you like it or not. So there is a massive conflict of interest here. And despite the fact that the iMob owns the politicians, the judges, the cops, you think Mark Zuckiniberg will pull a Barzini here and conduct a hit against the iMob? Of course not. I mean, look at him. The guy is spineless. You can knock this guy down in three seconds. Except, of course, if he shapeshifts into his lizard form and runs away. No wonder why Meta spends tens of millions of dollars on Mark Zuckiniberg's security. And here it is, the article says, Meta CFO cries wolf again with bleak Facebook outlook, but he may be right this time. And this is the gentleman we're talking about, the CFO of Facebook, David uh, Weiner, and he warned of impending financial doom at Facebook so many times that this column has dubbed him the chicken little of Silicon Valley. But this time, the sky may actually be falling. Da -da -da -da. Why? Because they're getting hit left and right. It's not just TikTok, it's the iMob, and oh by the way, the real reason behind the crash in Facebook stock. And here it is, the numbers don't lie, just like Shakira's hips. When we look at the revenue for Facebook in the fourth quarter this year, or last year I should say, the revenues were up 20% year over year. On the other hand, expenses were up higher by 38%. It's no wonder why the net income was down year over year by 8%. In this market, these numbers, you're not going to get a pass. The market is merciless because we have inflation. And if your expenses are rising higher than your revenue, then you're losing to inflation. Why the hell should I invest in your company? And you might ask, why is Facebook losing to inflation? They're not selling goods or anything like that. It's uh, services. Here's the answer. They're spending like a drunken sailor. Mark Zuckiniberg lost his mind. He's spending billions and billions and billions of dollars, left and right, by the way, to hire thousands of woke police whose sole job is to sit all day and monitor what people say on Facebook. And if it's not woke enough, if it is against the narrative, if it is perhaps another opinion about the holy jabs, you know, the miracle, they'll take you down. They'll shut your account. The suppression and censorship by Facebook. It's costing them right now. Matter of fact, Facebook, for the first time in its 18 years history, lost daily users. For the first time, once again. Why? It's unbearable anymore. You cannot go on Facebook and enjoy yourself like you used to. It's all garbage. Fact checkers are gonna hit your posts. Why? Why bother being Facebook? It's garbage. Oh, and by the way, the spending spree, it gets even better because Zucchiniberg is hiring an army of over 10,000 people in the EU alone to build his so-called The Metaverse, which is a scam, by the way. It's a glorified video game where everything is fake except the money. Your money, that's real. He'll take your money, but everything else is fake, including the farts in a jar. Here's another reason we're Facebook bomb. How about extreme wokeness? Yep, a little bit of wokeness, that's okay. But when you go overboard crazy, it's gonna cost you. For example, in the insane spending spree that Facebook has been on, they hired a so-called chief of civil rights. No, I'm not making this up. They actually have a chief of civil rights. And look at him. He looks like he's auditioning for law and order. But seriously, what does he do? He marches around the office. I have a dream. I have a dream. Like Martin Luther King, right? I have a dream that someday the big tech oligarchs will leave us alone. I have a dream that someday these mentally ill nerds that we made billionaires are going to spare us from their tyranny. And by the way, how does this guy cope with the fact that he's a civil rights chief while he's working for the evil side that suppresses civil rights? How does that jive with you? Whatever your name is. Anyways, here's another reason. The spending spree, like a drunken sailor, continues to go on. Out of the big cap companies, the tech oligarchs, which one spends the most on lobbying? The answer is Facebook followed by Amazon, and then you have uh, Microsoft, Alphabet, and at last, Apple. The iMob doesn't need to bribe anybody. They got everybody in their pockets from the get-go. And look here, I told Mark Zuckiniberg personally, and when I say personally, I mean back uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, when my channel had 50 subscribers. So I'm pretty sure he was paying attention to the channel. Anyways, back then, I told him, 
Personally, I told him it doesn't matter what you do. They're gonna cancel your ass. It doesn't matter if you hire an army of woke robots who are gonna censor and police stuff on Facebook. It doesn't matter. You committed the biggest sin ever. And for that, they're gonna punish you either way. So your job is to grow a pair and you go to Washington DC and say, you know what? My job as an owner of Facebook, a CEO, is not to police what people say. If somebody threatens somebody else, then sure, we'll take you down, we'll call the cops. But my job is not to police what people are saying, whether it's fact or not fact, whether it's misinformation or not, who gives a shit? It's not my job. If you want to do that job, fine. Hire your own goons and pay them from your own pocket. But I'm not going to incur the extra cost and damage my financials and punish my shareholders to police the platform. It's not my job. But of course, Mark Zuckiniberg is spineless. He's going to fall and he's going to try to kiss ass and please this mob. And they're never going to approve of him. Why? Because he committed the biggest sin. He's the one who cost Hillary the elections, right? If it wasn't for him, we would have all voted for Hillary. Matter of fact, I was planning to vote for her. I was waiting in line. And then I was playing with my phone and I saw an ad on Facebook and it changed my mind. And I decided to cast an absentee vote for Hulk Hogan. I mean, it's not the fact that America wanted to save their ears from bleeding, from listening to this all day. It <laughs> <laughs> will be next year. You, you did... <laughs> No, it's not that. Or the fact that the orange clown was saying the right things and people gave him a shot. It's the ads on Facebook. That's what changed the elections. Okay, but here it is. Today, Mark Zuckiniberg ratted his employees and made a video. And he said we should concentrate on video products so we can compete with TikTok and the rest. And he was crying like a little bitch. For what? Because he lost a little bit of money? And then he said, oh, I scratched my eyes. That's why I was crying. Okay. And here comes the analysts, the geniuses that they are. They're downgrading the stock after the crash. It'd be nice if they downgrade the stock before the crash, not after. And that brings up the question, why do we need analysts? Why are they even allowed to issue upgrades, downgrades, price targets? It's just market manipulation efforts. Where is the SEC, you might ask? The SEC remains in a coma. And even the biggest bull for Meta is capitulating. And JP Morgan, you know, the geniuses over there, the criminals that they are, they're now downgrading the stock. After it already crashed, after everybody already lost their money, after the stock lost a quarter of a trillion dollars, now they're downgrading the stock. And it's the same story, by the way, for PayPal, which we covered in yesterday's video. Now, after the crash, they're downgrading the price targets. It's a freak show. It shouldn't be allowed. But hold your horses. We have somebody who's actually bullish in the stock. And he is recommending that we buy the dip in Meta. Jim Reed, the strategist at Douche Bank, noted that Meta's after-hour losses equate to an arousal of more than $200 billion in market capitalization, greater than the market value of Netflix. He also added, this gives a scale of the damage done. Okay, this is not the guy. Why am I reading this? Here's the guy. For Christopher Rosbach, the chief investment officer of Anglo-Swiss asset manager Jay Stern, who cares? He says it may look like a buying opportunity. Oh, really? Rosebach said Meta's shares were attractively valued going into these numbers. Any further sitbacks makes it even more compelling opportunity for long-term investors. You ever heard of a value trap? Yes, the valuations are attractive, but if the insane spending spree continues, they're going to lose a lot of money. And oh, by the way, The Adventure by Mark Zuckiniberg, the metaverse, which is a glorified video game. Do you really want to take a shot at that? He's going to spend billions and billions and billions of dollars to create a glorified video game, which is going to be a walk nightmare, by the way. Your avatar might walk a certain way. It bumps into another avatar. And they're accused of sexual harassment. Yada, yada, yada. Before the earnings were released, Meta stock was already down 5% so far this year and nearly 35% lower from its record close last September. This genius also says, despite a slowdown in user growth and higher costs that missed market expectations, Meta's results for the fourth quarter delivered strong fundamental performance and revenues and profitability. Are you blind or something? The net profit went down 8%. Anyways, he also added, and while higher costs linked to investments in the metaverse may leave a bad taste in some investors' mouth, he views it as a good thing. What a creep. Isn't that sexual harassment? Anyways, 
Let's move on to earnings because we have massive moves after the bell. And we're talking, of course, about Amazon and Snapchat. Let's talk about Snapchat first. And uh, by the way, somebody gave you a little tip before the video ended yesterday. I don't know if you listened to it or not. If you did not, boy, you're missing out on a steak and lobster kind of trade. We're talking about a lot of yayo. Take a listen. Snapchat, this is the one that you got to watch carefully. If it opens down 20% as it's doing after hours and it did not report earnings yet, let's say after the bell, Snapchat reports bad earnings, missing the top, the bottom line, who cares? The stock is already down 20% before reporting. The risk versus reward says it will probably pop higher. Keyword probably so you might want to buy some calls here if snapchat opens down 20 percent plus and today I dropped a little hint for you on twitter saying this the implied volatility is huge for snapchat worth taking the risk of opening calendar spreads to capture some value from the elevated premiums of short-term options and after the bill snapchat is up almost 60 percent yep last time i checked it was about 60 percent so the calendar spreads maybe not the best strategy here unless you open way out of the money but if you bought naked calls oh boy massive gains we're talking retirement kind of gains so sometimes not all the time all the time you lose your money sometimes you gotta listen to your uncle the maverick of wall street another one that reported after the bell moved significantly higher last time i checked about 17 percent higher is amazon but watch out here don't buy the hype because Amazon's North America sales went down from a growth of 40% year over year in 2020 to 9% in 2021. And this is exactly what I've been telling you in this channel for so long. The numbers that we got from 2020 and 2021, they will never be matched again because that bump was due to the stimmies. That was a transitory inflation in corporate earnings. We're not going to match that again. And oh, by the way, Amazon missed on revenue and got it down for next quarter. Are you paying attention or not? Or are you just jerking off to the after hour gains? The reason why the stock popped higher after hours, well, to begin with, it was down, what, 8% in the regular hours? So it was already beaten down. And then came this, Amazon Prime price is going higher to 139 bucks per year. So you're paying 20 bucks extra for your Amazon Prime membership. Is this going to cause certain folks to close their accounts? Maybe. But all in all, this is a positive move by Amazon. Why? Are they raising prices higher? This is why. How about inflation? I don't know if you heard about it or not, but it's costing Amazon specifically wage inflation. Wages are going higher. Well, it's a no-brainer. They're going to pass that extra cost to you and I, the consumer. But here's perhaps the main reason behind the massive pop in Amazon shares after hours. Option traders were stampeding buying put options today against Amazon. They assumed that Netflix went down, Facebook went down, and so will Amazon. I'm always worried when everybody stampedes on one side of the trade. Because usually, not always, but usually, the opposite happens. So you have all of these put options buyers shorting the stock. And then the company comes after hours and says, you know what? Yes, we missed the revenue. We're guiding down, but we're hiking prices higher. This is the positive piece of all of this. And this triggered a massive wave of short covering after hours. Does it mean that the company's fundamentals are great? Matter of fact, price hikes or not, next quarter, they're gonna bomb. And oh, by the way, I don't know if we have uh, viewers from the Netherlands, also known as Holland. Because uh, Jeff Bezos, oligarch Bezos, he's forcing you guys to dismantle a historic bridge so his asshole mega yacht can pass. And I say, you know what? How about you guys grow some balls and tell Bezos dismantle your mega yacht? We're not taking down the bridge. And if you do that, I'm going to buy shares of Dutch Bros. Just in solidarity. Now, let's move on to the preview of the upcoming jobs number. And the leading indicator is, well, before we do that, we already know that the Black Rock administration sent their representative, Brian Deese, who came out and played down the expectations for the upcoming jobs number. So they already know that it's going to be a disaster number. That's point number one. Point number two, we have a leading indicator in the ADP jobs report, which only covers the private sector of this economy. And here's the number from CNBC's Steve Leisman. And by the way, I'm blocked by pretty much all of CNBC's personalities on Twitter, except Steve Leisman, who perhaps have a thicker skin than the rest. But here it is, Steve Leisman with the ADP jobs numbers. Minus 301,000 ADP, saying that January private payrolls declined by 301,000. They revised down their 
Uh, December payrolls to 776 from the 807, which, by the way, remains a huge miss relative to what the BLS reported. But here are the numbers, minus 301,000 versus an estimate of 200,000 on the street. Uh, just for the record, we did discuss on Monday the possibility of a negative print for the Friday BLS report. Uh, the goods sector falling 27,000, and the big hit in services down 274,000 as apparently Omicron had a massive effect. And there's the estimate for Friday, 150,000. You'll note that when we reported this initially, the estimate was 178,000. Dow Jones has now taken down that to 150,000. So this is a disaster, hinting that the economy is indeed in stagflation. We're losing jobs now. And by the way, who predicted all of that? I told you in this channel repeatedly that those leisure and hospitality jobs with the high wages, the moment the economy slows down, they're going to give you the boot right away. We're going to lose these jobs as fast as we gain them. And here are the details. Small businesses lost 144,000 jobs. Medium businesses lost 59,000 jobs. And large businesses lost 98,000 jobs. When we look at these sectors, leisure and hospitality down 154,000 jobs. Trade, transportation, utilities, down 62,000 jobs. Manufacturing, down 21,000 jobs. Education and health services, down 15,000 jobs. And lastly, construction lost 10,000 jobs in the month of January. So this is a bad leading indicator. But so far, we haven't seen a correlation between the ADP jobs report and the BLS jobs number. Why? I mean, it's supposed to be an indicator because the ADP counts the private sector alone. But somehow, at least in the last few months, the ADP report shows a high number of jobs created in the private sector of the economy. Yet the BLS, the government's job, which counts the private and the public sectors combined, gave us lower numbers than the ADP reports. And this happened for the last few months, by the way. So does that make sense to anybody listening to this program right now? That the private sector alone created more jobs than the private and the public sectors combined? Of course not. But why do we continue to see these distortions and divergences between the ADP jobs number and the BLS jobs number? The answer is because of the government cooks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They cook the numbers to manipulate the market higher. And to manipulate the market higher, you need to give the market a number in the sweet spot that hints that perhaps the Fed will not be as aggressive as the market thinks. Meaning, the market is concerned that the Fed will tighten the monetary policy, aka the cocaine, aggressively, and therefore it has been going down. Because Jerome Powell said, my goal is maximum employment. So if we have good jobs numbers, then the Fed has no incentive anymore to continue to grease up the stock market with more coke. But if we get numbers that are lower than expectations, then we haven't reached the maximum employment threshold. And therefore, the expectations are the Fed will remain accommodative. Now, that's in the past. Now, the Fed is going to tighten either way because inflation has gotten out of control. But I'm just giving you an example of the manipulation that happens every single report in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Another ominous signal for the number we're about to receive tomorrow. Today, we got the ISM Services Index, which showed that the economy is slowing down dramatically when it comes to growth and economic activities in the services sector of this economy. Matter of fact, the pace of growth in the services sector of this economy was the lowest in 16 months, according to the survey. So this is yet another leading indicator that perhaps the number we're about to get tomorrow is going to show job losses in the economy. And here's yet another leading indicator spilling ominous signs for the report we're about to get in the morning. Small business wages are moving higher and higher and higher. Matter of fact, the reading that we have for the month of January is the highest of all time, meaning wages are moving higher dramatically, while perhaps the economy is not creating many jobs. Again, what does that mean? How about stagflation? The pace of creating jobs is going down. On the other hand, the pace of inflation is moving higher. And this is what the market will be concentrating on in tomorrow's report. It's a game of expectations. The market already knows that the number will be bad. The expectations are for about, let's say, 150,000 jobs created in January. If the ADP report is a leading indicator, then forget about 150,000 jobs. Perhaps the economy lost jobs last month. And this will be okay with the stock market because we already knew that ahead of time. But if wage inflation moves higher, and oh, by the way, the unemployment rate goes down anyways, oh boy, then you bet that the market's expectations of Fed rate hikes will move higher by a lot 
Perhaps we will have 50 basis points in the bank for Mosh. And the stock market is not going to like that. Despite Amazon, despite the pop in Snapchat, all of that is not going to last. If we get a number, a weak number, suggesting that the economy lost jobs, yet wage inflation is moving higher. And oh, by the way, despite the job losses, we are at maximum employment because the unemployment rate is actually going down. So Papa Jerome Powell will have no choice but to become even more hawkish. Anyhow, folks, let's move on to cover the market information for you. And we start with the performance of the market today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average down by 518.17 points or a loss of 1.45%. The Nasdaq down by 538.73 points or a decline of 3.74%. The S&P 500 also down by 111.94 points or a decline of 2.44%. What about the sector's performance today? Shame on all of them. We're not giving any medals today, and the laggards of the day led by communication services, technology, and consumer cyclicals. What about the advance to decline ratios? The NYSE 19% advancing versus 78% declining. The NASDAQ 19% advancing versus 79% declining. And again, when we see these exaggerated ratios to the downside, you gotta get a pop at least in the pre-market. Moving on to commodities, futures, what's going on here? Look at crude oil prices. Both the WTI and Brent are reading above 90. The WTI gained over 2% today. Brent gained almost 2% today. We also have gasoline up along with heating oil up almost 2.5% today. While natural gas down almost 10.5%. As we see lots of profit taking, the volatility in natural gas is unbelievable. And of course, we continue to watch the storm, specifically in Texas, because Texas is where the risk is. What about softs? Look at lumber, climbing higher again, above 1,000, gaining almost 4.5% today. We also have gains for coffee, cotton, and cocoa. On the other hand, sugar, pretty much in the flat line, while OJ declining again, losing almost half a percentage point today. What about metals? Disappointing performance here. Even even with the dollar down due to the pop in the euro, and the euro moved higher after the ECB, not the ECB, well, it is the ECB too, but the Bank of England hiked trades today, and the ECB came out with a hawkish outlook, and therefore the euro moved higher while the dollar went down. Yet even with that, gold is not moving higher. And oh, by the way, silver aided on the chin today, losing almost 1.5%. We also have losses for platinum, copper, and palladium. What about meats? Muted activities across the board, even for the new big tech lean hogs not moving higher today, trimming some of the gains and losing a little over half a percentage point today. And lastly, what about grains? Mixed picture here, muted across the board. We don't have any sizable activity whatsoever. We have some noticeable losses here. For corn futures down almost 1%, but besides that, the picture is pretty much flattish. <music> Moving on to the options market, the big casino, what's going on here? Look at the options volume moving higher, not across the board, but in two names, Apple and Meta. Apple remains the hottest table by far, with almost 1.3 million contracts traded today, about 61% of those were calls. And at number two, the ticker FB for Meta. Forget about Meta, it's Facebook. With a little over 1.2 million contracts, about 61% of those were calls. And at number three, PayPal. With almost 900,000 contracts traded today, about 59% of those were calls. Lots of buying of the dip here via calls. Perhaps a bullish sign for the market here, even if it is a slim one. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, we start with the ticker FB, Facebook. The buying the dip here, it was the most active name in the options market when we talk about the numbers. How much spent per trade. Facebook at number one. And this is one of the trades, mostly calls of course. In this case, they're buying the 250 calls for the expiration date, February 18th. With the expectations that Facebook could rebound by more than 5.5% by then. They paid about 6 bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $12 million. What about the ticker QCOM for Qualcomm? Somebody's buying the dip here by opening the 200 bucks calls for the expiration date, February 11th. With the expectations, the name could drop high, drop higher. 
pop higher by more than 11% by then. They paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1 million. And what about the trade for the ticker PYPL PayPal? They're buying the dip here by opening the 140 calls for the expiration date February 18th. With the expectations, the name could rebound higher by more than 12.5% by then. They paid about one buck and 10 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.3 million. Notice that all of these rebound plays for the names that drop big, Facebook, Qualcomm, PayPal, is for the short term. So we have a lack of conviction here, even in playing the rebound. What about the trade for the ticker KRE? This is for regional banks. It is sort of a proxy of the 10-year yield, meaning if the 10-year yield moves higher, the KRE moves higher too, because regional banks benefit from a higher yield. Likewise, when the 10-year yield drops down, the KRE follows through. So here we have somebody buying puts, meaning betting that the 10-year yield would drop down. They bought the 66 puts for the expiration date, March 18th, with the expectations the name could drop down by more than 8% by then. And if you're going to follow this one, be careful because the spread between the bet and the ask is too wide. But in this case, they paid about two and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about two million dollars. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker QQQ for the NASDAQ? They're buying calls here, interesting, the 372 calls for the expiration date February 28th, with the expectations that the Qs will pop higher by more than 5% by then. They paid about 3 bucks and 50 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about two and a half million dollars. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here? A bloodbath across the board, with very few exceptions. For example, the ticker TMUS, T-Mobile, they reported earnings today and the name is popping higher. We have certain names in healthcare like AbV, the ticker ABBV, and UNH, United Health moving higher. In industrials, we have an exception here. It's a bloodbath, but we have an exception in the ticker ITW, Illinois Toolworks, also reported earnings today. And then we have an exception in materials. Look at that little green dot right there. That's Alcoa, one of the names I've been a cheerleader for since God knows when. And it's popping higher today. We also have the staple giants, the consumer staples, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Coca-Cola, Mondelez, Hershey's. Look at Hershey's moving higher big. I made a case for Hershey's back in November. And these consumer staples giants are a good bit for now. They're a safety trade, and the reason is they are inflation-proof, at least for now. But besides that, it was a bloodbath across the market today. What about the heat map for the ETFs? Unless you held some inverse ETFs, everything was down today. Even energy. Energy was down. XOP, XLE, nothing performed at all. Even international markets were down. The only performers are the inverse indices, the SQQs, the inverse for the Nasdaq, the SPXS, the inverse for the SPY, the TZA, the inverse for the IWM, the SOXS, the inverse for chips, the FAZ, the inverse for financials, and the VIX proxies, the VXX and the UVXY. But besides that, it's a bloodbath. Moving on to the charts analysis, when we start with the 30 minutes chart for the SPY, the S&P 500. Again, we saw a bear flag when you zoom out in this chart, and the bear flag is playing out, and the SPY lost a lot of support here. It lost 454, it lost 451, and it is fighting to hold the support of 456 and a half. And look at how fast and violent the correction for the overboard conditions on the RSI happened. And the telltale was the semi-gap and crap that we got yesterday. And your question right now is, well, what about Amazon and Snapchat? Well, Amazon and Snapchat will not hold the market alone. We need broad participation here, and it's not happening. You cannot just continue to move higher on the backs of the big caps. And by the way, the earnings are not that good for Amazon. So we might see another gap and crap for Amazon. All eyes tomorrow will be on the jobs number from the BLS. And again, I don't care about the headline number, to be honest with you. I care about the unemployment rate and wage inflation. And depending on how the market is going to read it, it's going to move up or down. So right now, unfortunately, you watching this video, the technicals don't matter this much because it's all about the jobs number we're about to get tomorrow. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract of the SPY? We went all the way down and now we're retesting the support of 4,472. Is it going to hold? Is it not going to hold? Well, we have a pop after hours because Amazon is so large when it moves double digits, it's going to lift these indices higher. The risk is, what if we have another gap and crap? 
The line in the sand right now is 4,000. 472. If that's breached again, then we have a significant sign of weakness in the stock market. Look at the volume. It is moving higher on the selling side. This is bearish sign number one. Bearish sign number two, the momentum indicators just reverse the negative divergence, but they're already curling down. So we have significant weakness here and lack of momentum, lack of build through. What do I mean by that? The shorts covered initiating the bear market rally. But where are the buyers? Where are the options traders? They're nowhere to be found. They don't have the confidence that this is indeed another correction that we're going to put behind us and we will make all-time highs again. Nobody's thinking like that anymore. And before any of you wise asses say, well, perhaps that's a contrarian indicator, right? You can play that game all you want. Go ahead and buy. But a break like this is a game changer. The trend is already over. There is no, oh, it's a contrarian indicator that everyone is bearish right now. They are bearish for a reason. Number one, the Fed is hawkish. And the reason is inflation continues to surge out of whack. And oh, by the way, we're starting to find signs that this economy is weakening dramatically. And we're starting to realize that the pops that we got in earnings in 2020 and 2021 are not going to be sustainable anymore because they happen due to the trillions in stimmies. Absent of a new stimmy, earnings will come down and therefore stocks will come down. Moving on to the Qs, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Look at that. The bear flag played out and we have a lot of losses here. A lot of support lost. We lost the support. 365 and a half, we lost. 363, we lost. 360, and we're now looking at 352. Amazon popped higher. Can we at least recapture 360 in the morning? We'll see. I'm not too positive here. I gotta see it to believe it. I gotta see the cues recapturing 360, and oh, by the way, closing the day above 360. Otherwise, I'm not buying any pop here. And here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. We went down to retest 4,000. 445. The chart did not get quite there, but again, breaching that line will be an alarming signal. And my threshold right now, what I want the cues to show me before I start buying again, is a recapture of 15,000 by tomorrow. Meaning, you gotta close the week above 15,000 in the futures contract. Otherwise, I'm not buying this. And I will continue to say, sell the rip. And on top of that, the volume is moving higher on the selling side. And the momentum indicators, look at the RSI, never reverse the negative divergence. And it is curling down again. All of these are not good signs for the Qs. What about a 30 minutes chart for the IWM, the Russell 2000, small caps? Remember when a few days ago, genius from JP Morgan, Marco Klonanovic, What a stupid son of a bitch came out and said buy the Russell 2000, the IWM, because the correction is over. Now you know, we have a bear flag. It played to the downside. The IWM closed the day at the lows of the session. Not a good sign. Now, you can squint your eyes a little bit and see a double bottom and then perhaps a formation of a bull flag in the macro outlook. That could be the case, but I have to see it to believe it. What does that mean? I need to see the IWM recapturing 204.5 as support and reconfirming that support before I buy the IWM once again. Otherwise, the line in the sand is 191.5. If that is breached, then cue the nuclear bomb. What about the Dixie, the dollar index? Again, the pop in the euro dropped the dollar down, losing the support of 96. This is a bullish sign for the stock market that the dollar is pulling down, but it's insignificant for now. If you heard any of the corporate earnings, the calls that we got so far, almost every single one complains about the rise in the US dollar. It cost them it crushed the bottom line, etc., etc. So a drop in the US dollar is welcomed by the stock market. But for the market to start to feel that drop as a positive catalyst, the dollar has to go down and lose the support of 93.7. We're not there yet. Keyword, yet. What about the old man, gold? Not looking good here, folks. The dollar is down big. Why didn't gold rally? For now, I'm keeping my bear flag until and unless gold recaptures 1,835 once again and trades above the three amigos. But perhaps a bullish sign here. The headline reads, looks like there is a whale snapping up gold bullion below 1,800. And rumor has it, this is a picture of that whale. Anyhow, we're moving on to the daily chart of the, what is it? Uh, the 10-year yield. 
It is popping higher, but you take everything with a grain of salt when we have an important jobs number tomorrow that could impact this chart one way or the other. But the technicals for now are bullish. Why? Because we have overbought conditions on the RSI and MACD indicators, and the chart is working out these conditions via consolidation, which is a bullish way to work out these overbought conditions, signaling that there is another pop coming. Another sign that this is a bullish pattern the fact that the 10-year yield the chart held 1.77 as support over and over and over again it retested that line many times before and it held on so the risk versus reward here says the 10-year will pop higher absent of a nasty surprise in the jobs number here's the tlt weekly chart we have one day to close the week it's almost impossible for now that the TLT is going to move higher and close above the closing of last week. Yet what I would like to see here is a retest of 140. Let's see how 140 is going to hold. But mind you, this is a bear flag pattern. If 140 doesn't hold and we don't see buyers showing up, the TLT will lose the support of 140. And it's going to flush down all the way to 134 and a half. What about the four hours chart for the VIX? Again, we're starting to see signs of a bottoming formation here in the VIX. The VIX left the gap open, by the way. So perhaps in the morning, if we see a pop in the SPY on the heels of Amazon's earnings, the VIX could go down to close that gap. And watch how the chart is going to behave after closing the gap. If it rebounds higher again, watch out. We could see a gap in crap in the SPY in the Qs. If it closes the gap and then starts to trade below that, then it is a bullish sign for the SPY. You look at the MACD indicator, we're seeing a little tiny green impression, but we got to see a confirmation here. We need another impression, a green impression, perhaps a larger one, before we have a confirmation that the VIX has bottom for now what about a four hours chart for the vxn the vix for the nasdaq again look at the macd indicator we don't have a crossing here we don't have green impressions on the histogram yet what we have is red impressions that are getting shorter and shorter and shorter meaning the vxn is trying to find the bottom is this the bottom could be but there is risk if you look at the chart carefully you could see the potential of a head and shoulder formation and the VXN could go down. On the other hand, the flush down in the VXN that came hand in hand with a pop in the Qs, that flush down has stopped for now because the VXN stopped the bleeding and produced green candles. Look at all of these green candles. Is this the bottom for now? And if it is, then the Qs have lower low to go. And this is what I want you to do in the morning. I want you to look at the lows of the day in the VXN. Look at that little green candle that came right after the red candle, the last red candle from a four hours perspective i want you to look at the lows of that candle let's say the queues opens higher amazon gapping higher who cares if the vxn breaches the low of that candle then you know that the queues will continue to move higher and we haven't seen the bottom in the vxn yet However, if that low holds and we see the VXN rebounding higher again, then watch out, we will see a gap and crap in the NASDAQ. And here it is, a daily chart for Apple, one of the few good signs for the bulls, because as Apple goes, so will the market. Despite the flush down in the queues, Apple held ground and kept the support of 172.4. Is this behavior bullish or bearish? The answer is it is bullish. And if Apple holds, it is really hard to see how the market is going to continue to flush down with Apple holding and perhaps trading higher. As Apple goes, so will the market. What about Tesla, the souffle? This is an hourly chart. A lot of manipulation here. We saw a bear flag producing a gap down in the morning, yet immediately we saw insane volume of buying the stock, producing what it appears to be for now a bull flag pattern. If that plays out, then perhaps Tesla will retest 995 as resistance once again. Why did Tesla buck the trend today? Here's the answer. Options market manipulation. The so-called Tesla whale, who does these kind of moves once in a while, did it again, buying an enormous amount of calls to pump and dump the stock. They buy significant quantities of calls in the morning. The stock moves higher. They dump right away on the heads of the chasers. And now you might ask, where is the SEC? The answer is the SEC remains in a coma. And we have more bad news for the souffle here. The recalls continue to go on. Today, we have 817,000 souffles in the U.S. getting recalled. And the reason is, seat belt or no seat belt, the car is not going to let you know or remind you that you're not wearing a seat belt. Any other car out there has an alarm. So if you drive the vehicle without the seat belt on, it's going to start ringing. Not the souffle though. More bad news. Tesla owners are complaining about a problem that makes cars slam the brakes for no reason.
Uh oh. When I drive out there and I see a souffle in front of me, behind me, next to me, avoid, change lanes, drive faster, because these things could act erratically at any moment with no warning at all, jeopardizing the safety of all drivers on the road. Matter of fact, since October of last year, this is the ninth recall for the souffle. We're not talking five years ago till today, we're talking since October of last year. The ninth recall, and the regulators are not paying attention at all. Even though the souffle treat their drivers as lab rats, and in doing so, they put all of us at risk. Where are the regulators, by the way? The answer is, the regulators are in a coma. Lastly, what about tulips? BTC, what's going on here? Not looking good, folks. But the good news for the bulls is, BTC continues to hold on at the support of 35000 750 that is the line in the sand if bitcoin trades below that number be careful we're going down to 30,000 but so long as it continues to hold on there is still hope that we could find buyers maybe a rotation from stocks to tulips i don't know could happen moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow just in case you are not paying attention throughout the video we have the big jobs report the cooks are gonna be busy 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 doing what giving us a cold meal that indicates that the economy is not at full employment yet. The problem is this is easier said than done because how can you cook the wage inflation out? Maybe a little salt, a little pepper, you can mask the wage inflation, but we're going to see through that. And if wage inflation goes higher and unemployment goes down, despite the losses in jobs, then the Fed will have no choice but to tighten while the economy is in stagflation. Wow. And with that, folks, we're done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.